Well, we're going to continue our summer series called Strong and Courageous, Entering the New Normal. We've been studying this Old Testament book of Joshua together over the last few weeks, and we've been looking at some of the key chapters and key stories within this book. It's an incredible book about this man called Joshua and how he was called by God to lead the people of Israel, God's people, into this new land, this new territory. It was a land that God had promised his people, an incredible land, which was flowing with milk and honey. But there were, also, there were also enemies in this land as well. But God had promised this amazing place for his people to dwell, live in, and enjoy. And I really believe that this book speaks to us today. I believe that God wants to speak to us through the stories within this book to help us and prepare us as we enter into a new season, as we enter into this post-pandemic world. And so today we're going to come to part four of this series and the title of today's message is it doesn't make sense we're going to be basing ourselves today in joshua chapter 6 and verse 1 to 5 this is what it says now the gates of jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the israelites no one was allowed to go in or out but the lord said to joshua i have given you jericho its king and all its strong warriors you and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead with the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times with priests blowing the horns. When you hear the priests give one long blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can. Then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. I've mentioned it before, but I have a dog whose name is Charlie. She's a wonderful puppy and she's a cockalier. She's a lovely dog and uh, she loves to play. She's got a lot of energy. She loves going out for walks in the local area. I usually take her over to the Day Valley Country Park and she loves going over there and jumping into every single stream and every string, single river. She loves chasing stones and sticks. And then sometimes, I take her down to the local football field as well if I haven't got that long to walk her and I usually take a tennis ball with me and I throw the tennis ball and she absolutely loves chasing the tennis ball. She's full of energy and she loves to play. Well a few weeks ago I took Charlie down to the football field on my lunch break and uh, I took her down there just so she could burn off a little bit of energy and I took the tennis ball with me. So I started walking around the football field. I had done about one lap and then I continued to throw the ball. I threw the ball and I seen Charlie go after it. But I noticed that my shoelace was untied. So I bent down to do up my laces. I lifted up my head to see Charlie, see where she was. But all I could see was Charlie and she didn't have the ball in her mouth as usual. But she was there with her paw in the air like this. She had seemed to have hurt her left paw. Now she had done something very similar to this last summer when we went up the mountain for a walk. We were walking down the mountain and she was chasing some stones down the mountain and she jarred her leg then and sprained her leg and I took her to the vet and they gave her some anti-inflammatory anti tablets and she seemed to be fine after a few days. But I was worried when I seen Charlie like this, as you can imagine, she's my baby, she's my dog. And I was worried for her that she had broken her leg. I thought that the worst had happened. Now she wasn't whimpering, she wasn't crying, but she couldn't walk on her legs. So I had to carry her home. I spoke to my parents and we decided that we were gonna leave her rest, see how she goes for the rest of that day. And then if she doesn't improve in the next day or two, that we'd phone the vets. Well, she didn't improve. Her leg was badly injured and uh, she couldn't walk on her leg. She was limping around and she was sleeping most of that day, the rest of that day. Well, the next day came and I decided that I was going to phone the vets because I was worried about it. So I phoned our local vets, but they said that they weren't able to get a vet in. So I tried a few other local vets and they also were having trouble finding vets. And they said the, that they would only be able to have a vet within the next two weeks. And it wasn't a guarantee that we'd be able to get a spot. Now, that wasn't any good to me because I could see that Charlie was in a lot of pain. So I said to the vet, I explained what had happened over the phone. I explained her situation and the sort of actions that Charlie was doing and that she wasn't in a lot of pain, she was still eating some food. So I said, was there any chance I could get some anti-inflammatories and just see how they go for a few days 
And then if these tablets don't work, then I'll book her in and I'll bring her in. So the vet agreed and she gave me a prescription for these tablets and Charlie took them and thank Jesus that she is fine, that her leg was okay. But the vets did tell me and my parents and uh, my brothers who usually take my dog for a walk, they said that she is to take it easy for the next week or two, that we to ease her in. She can't go for all her usual walks, but to ease her in gently. So over the, we let her take these tablets for the three days. We kept her in the house, just took her out the garden if she needed to go to the toilet or whatever, and that was it. But then we decided to slowly start taking her along, around the, the local streets and go for a walk over to the country park just to take it easy. But I kept it on the lead whenever I took her for a walk. But when I was taking her, Charlie didn't understand why I had to keep her on the lead, especially every time we went over to the Day Valley Country Park. She didn't understand why she couldn't chase the stones, why she couldn't go in the river. And she'd often pout and she'd often cry whenever we get near the riverbank because she wanted to go in, but I wouldn't let her because of her leg. I didn't want her playing because I didn't want her hurting her leg again. The vet said that she needs to regain strength in her leg again. So she couldn't play as usual. She couldn't run as usual. But Charlie didn't quite understand. She was pouted in. Now I'm glad to say that she's back on her feet. She's like a nutter now and she's going back to normal. But she didn't understand why she couldn't play. It was for her own good. It was tr to strengthen her. But she didn't understand why she couldn't play or why she couldn't do the things that she wanted to do. You know, as I was thinking about this chapter in Joshua, which we come to today, and as I was thinking even about this with Charlie, you know, me and you can act very similar to that, can't we? We can act and there's things that come our way in our lives which we don't quite understand. We don't know why things are happening to us. For example, children, before they might want a bit of chocolate or some sweets before their tea, but their parents won't allow them to have any snacks before dinner because it'll spoil their dinner. But the children don't understand. They'll pout and they'll moan and they're like, why is this happening? This is crazy. Just allow me to have a bit of chocolate. You know, even teenagers can be a bit like that. Maybe when they like a girl or they like a boy and, and that person doesn't like them back. And they're like, why? I don't understand. I don't get it. Why don't you like me like I like you? You know, even as adults, we can question life and there are things that come our way which we don't understand, aren't there? You know, we, we don't understand why life doesn't turn out the way that we plan for, the way that we dream. We don't understand why we didn't get that house, why we didn't get that job or why we were fired. We don't understand why our loved one has got that illness. We don't understand why there's a break in a relationship. And we don't even understand why our world has completely changed because of this virus. We don't understand. We don't like it. We don't understand what is fully going on. And even as Christians, you might be watching this today and you're a Christian. We can be like that even as followers of Jesus. We don't understand what God is doing in our lives sometimes. We don't understand why God is asking us to do something which seems crazy, which seems out of the normal. It doesn't make sense in the natural. So you might be saying today, what do we do when we don't understand? Have you ever asked that question? What are we going to do when we don't understand? Well, we see a great example here in Joshua chapter 6 today. The people of God, they were in a very similar situation and feeling that frustration. I don't get it. I don't get why God's calling us to do this thing. It doesn't make sense. I don't understand. Now we've seen up until this point, the nation of Israel, the people of God, they'd gone through an awful lot. They don't had to overcome a lot of enemies. They traveled through the wilderness. They had left Egypt. They'd gone through an awful lot as a people. And you might think, you know, that's enough now. That's enough. You know, God don't allow them to go through anymore. But our God knows exactly when it's enough. He knows our frame. He knows how much we can handle in our lives. And I believe there's someone who's watching this right now and you are going through a difficult situation right now and you're just thinking, God, it's enough. But maybe God wants to use that circumstance and that situation not to hurt you or destroy you, but to strengthen you. Maybe God wants to do something within your life. Turn to the Lord in this situation. And you know, the people of God, they've gone through an awful lot. But God was going to come to them and he was going to test them again. You know, this book of Joshua is a historically accurate book. It's some incredible challenges that goes on here. There's battles, there's losses, there's victories. And you know, it's very much a picture 
of the Christian life. Our Christian lives are like this, full of victories moving forward, but also taking two steps back or three steps back and seeing defeat and losses within our lives full of obstacles. That's very much a picture of the Christian life. And also having a hope of inheriting that promised land which God has promised, which is for you and me, eternal life. But now today, the nation was going to face another challenge, as I said. And this challenge was going to come and it was going to test their faith. They now came to the first city in the promised land. They crossed over the Jordan River, which we'd seen last time. They now were in the promised land and they came to the city, this big city, the great city within this promised land where their enemies dwelt. And this city was called Jericho. This, wall, this city was a walled city with massive walls and there was great enemies and they had a great army. But you know what's interesting here is the people of God arrived at Jericho. We see that the test that God was going to put them through wasn't a test of their skill or their strength or their, their military's ability. But actually God was about to test their courage whether or not they would obey in him. God was going to test their obedience even if it didn't make sense to them at that point. He wanted them to obey. Now, Bible scholars say that Jericho sat on about eight or nine acres. It was a massive city and they had huge, huge walls. And the people of God actually thought that there were giants dwelling within it because of the size of the walls of Jericho. It was a huge city and the people of God sometimes were afraid of that. And listen to what it says as we come to Joshua chapter 6, verse 3. This is what God says as they approach, the people of God approach the city. It says, you and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Now, God had called his people to inherit this land, to overcome their enemies. But God here says to them as they approach Jericho, they're not to rush in, they're not to fight against the people of Jericho. But actually what God calls them to do is walk around the walls of the city for six days. It's strange, isn't it? But God commands Joshua and the people to march to victory. It was a march to victory crusade. You know, you heard me right there. It was a march. It wasn't a fight. It wasn't a battle. It wasn't hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was a march. And as they marched around the city, God says to Joshua and his people that then they would gain victory. You know, sometimes when we face battles within our lives or when we enter new seasons, don't be surprised for God to ask us to do things that don't make sense to us in the natural. Sometimes God will bring a situation into our lives which we didn't plan for, which we don't expect. God isn't interested in seeing how we can handle these situations and these surprising circumstances in our own strength. He isn't interested in seeing how we can handle those times in which we don't understand. But he wants to test our obedience to him. He wants to, to test our obedience. You know, it says in Isaiah 55, verse 8 to 9, God says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For as just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Now, as we come to Joshua 6, you know, God could have used Joshua he could have used his military ability and said, go on, go and conquer that land. Use your military ability, use your soldiers, use your weapons and go in and bring about destruction to that land. However, God says, you're not going to gain victory that way this time. This time, you're going to have to walk around the walls. And I believe the re one of the reasons for this is because I know that the Joshua is very similar to me. You know, he's a man just like me. And if I had fought a victory in my own strength, then I'd be tempted to take all the glory for myself. But you know, the Bible tells us that our God is a jealous God and he wants to receive the glory. He deserves all the glory. All glory and honor should go to him. And we see here that God says, I'm going to give you victory, but I don't want you to be tempted to worship yourself and be confident in yourself, but I want to receive the praise and glory. I'm going to bring you through in this situation. His glory God's glory will not be shared with anybody, as it says in Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 8. And so for six days, the people of God march around the walls of Jericho, commanded by God. And you know, it's interesting in verse 10 to 14, we see the, the Joshua and God tells Joshua to tell the people they're not allowed to even speak as they walk around these walls. For six days, they're not allowed to say a word. 
You know, you might be wondering, why is that? Why can't they even speak as they walk around the walls? Well, God knows exactly what we're like. And if I was in their position, if I lived all those years ago and I was called to do that with them, then I'm sure I'd be questioning Joshua. I'd be questioning God. You know, this seems crazy. I don't understand. This doesn't make sense. We've got an army. We've got weapons. Why on earth are we doing this? I'm sure the people would have doubted God. And that's why God says, look, I don't want anybody to speak for these six days. Don't shout. Don't even talk, as it says there. And he says, look, march around these walls. Take the priests with you, with the ark, which represents God's presence. Walk around the walls. Take your ram's horns. And then he says, on the seventh day, I want you to blow the ram's horns. And then on the last, blow the horn. Then I want all the people to finally shout, to lift up a shout. And then you will see victory. And so the people of God do this. Every day, they walk around the wall once, and then they go back to camp and wouldn't say a word. For six days, they would do it. Now, I'm sure the people thought that this was aimless. This was pointless. And have you ever felt like that in life? You know, why am I doing this? Why is God allowing this to happen in my life? This seems pointless, seems aimless. Is there any any purpose to this at all? It seems confusing. And I'm sure the people of God felt like that. But you know, I'm sure they would have thought that, you know, there must be a better way to conquer this city. But you know, God says here, I don't want you to talk. I don't want you to complain or murmur or question me. Just walk around the walls, obey me and watch what I am going to do. And so the seventh day, the final day, finally arrives. I'm sure the people were anxious. I'm sure they were ready to have a go at Joshua, ready to blame God if this didn't work. I'm sure they questioned God. I'm sure they were wondering, you know, what if the walls don't come tumbling down? What if Joshua's got this wrong? What if God has got this wrong? I'm sure they were nervous and afraid as well. I'm sure they thought, that they might see defeat within their lives. What if these past six days have been a waste of time? Well, listen to what happens in Joshua 6, verse 15 to 21. It says, On the seventh day, the Israelites got up at dawn and marched around the town as they had done before. But this time they went around the the town seven times. The seventh time around, as the priest sounded the long blast of the horns, Joshua commanded the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the town. Jericho and everything in it must be completely destroyed as an offering to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and the others in her house will be spared, for she protected our spies. Do not take any things set apart for destruction, or or you yourselves will be completely destroyed, and you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. Everything made of silver, gold, bronze, or iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into his treasury. When the people heard the sound of the ram's horns, they shouted as loud as they could. Suddenly, the walls of Jericho collapsed and the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured it. They completely destroyed everything in it with their swords, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, goats and donkeys. What happens here? The people obey God. After, Even though it doesn't make sense, even though they didn't understand, they obeyed God. And God gives them victory. The walls of Jericho completely came down. They were completely destroyed. They lifted up that shout, that shout of praise, and victory came. And you know, I want to say, even in passing here, the praise always precedes victory. There is power in praise. And I want to encourage you, if you are facing a battle right now, if you've hit a wall, then begin to praise God. Lift up praises to our God. The Bible says that all in the city were destroyed. All the walls came down, apart from one house, Apart from one section of the wall. Listen to what it says in verse 22 to 25. Meanwhile, Joshua said to the two spies, Keep your promise. Go to the prostitute's house and bring her out along with all her family. The men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, mother and brothers, and all her relatives who were with her. They moved her her whole family to a safe place near the camp of Israelites. Of Israel. Then the Israelites burned the town and everything in it. Only the things made from silver, gold or bronze were kept for the treasury of the Lord's house. So Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute and her relatives who were with her in the house because she had hidden the spies Joshua sent to Jericho. And she still lives among the Israelites to this day. As we've seen a few weeks ago, no one is too far away from God for God to rescue and God to save. Rahab put her faith in God. She asked God to save her and her family. 
And God showed mercy towards her and saved Rahab. And as I said there, I love that part there at the end of verse 25 there. She still lives among the Israelites today and she went on to be part of Jesus's ancestry and lineage. What an incredible picture of God's mercy here. But you know, we see here that as God's people were obedient, God gave them victory. And listen to the testimony after that, the end of Joshua chapter 6 verse 27. So the Lord was with Joshua and his reputation spread throughout the land. You know, you might be wondering today, what's this got to do with you and me today? Well, this reminds us and this shows us today that God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts, but his ways are better and higher than our ways. He's got an incredible plan for our lives. And sometimes when things come our way, which we don't understand, we need to trust in God and obey God. Because then we will see victory within our lives. You know, obedience, it isn't a popular thing today. We don't like to listen to others or obey others. We think that we know best. Our world thinks that they know what is best. They live by their own truth, as people say today. You know, obedience isn't a popular thing. And obedience won't get the world's attention. But obedience will get God's attention. God responds to our obedience to him God knows what's best. And I love what it says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 to 6. It's a familiar Bible passage. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Just as Joshua obeyed God and trusted God to ultimately overcome Jericho and see victory in Jericho. So you and I today must trust in God and obey God and trust that he will give us victory over every obstacle that comes our way, over every challenge that comes our way, over every difficulty that comes our way, even when we don't understand. I want to encourage you to obey God, trust in God. Maybe you're watching this and you don't know God, and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Well, that's the first thing that you can do is surrender your life to Jesus. Put your life in his hands. Trust in him that he died on the cross and rose again because of his love for you. That his sacrifice on the cross was enough to save you from his, your sin. And that he will give you the gift of eternal life. Trust in God. And if you're facing a challenge or battle today and you don't know why it's come your way, you don't understand what's happening. God wants to encourage you to obey him. He knows what you do, he's doing. Your life is in his hands. And so as we come to a conclusion of this message today, I wonder what would happen if you did obey God with your life today, with our circumstance, with our situation? Would you see victory? Would you see victory over that addiction? Would you see victory in that area of finances? Would you see victory in that relationship, relationship situation? Would you see victory within your faith? I wonder, would you obey God today instead of leaning on your own understanding? What if you, what would happen if we as a church obey God in this new season as we enter into this post-pandemic world? What would happen? I believe that if we surrender to God and trusted in God and allowed him to lead us, even when it doesn't make sense, I believe we'll see our church built up. We'll see lives transformed. We'll see people growing in their faith, people coming to know Jesus. That's what can happen when we obey God. You know, when we listen to God's word, when we heed God's word instead of our own victor, intellect, then we'll see victory, then we'll see success in our lives. So what are we to do when we don't understand what happens to us in life, when life doesn't pan out the way that we expect or plan? Well, God wants to encourage us to obey him, because when we do, then we'll see victory, then we'll see his great plan for our lives come to pass. I want to encourage you today. Let's obey the Lord. Amen.